Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new net community alpha testing technical discussion. My name is Sam Lake, and I'm the community testing and developer relations manager. Um, I've been asked to do this AMA today to run you through some of the questions that we've had in from the community, um, but also to take the time to talk you through quite an important process that we would like to um, help you understand, which is around whilst doing testing, um, raising issues and bugs in a way that can be uh, easily handled and used by the developers. Um, so, First of all, what I'd like to do is say we're here finally, after quite a while, we finally made it to public alpha. Um, and as you probably are aware, we've kind of taken a stage testing approach to this. Um, and um, stage one was getting set up with a wallet on the test net and getting tokens to use for testing. Stage two, which is this week, has been installing the DMS software to get network connectivity running. And this is where we, what we're currently at now. Uh, next week, we can look forward to stage three, where we're going to install the service provider dashboard to be able to request jobs and initiate ML jobs to run. Um, and then stage four, we're going to look at the compute provider dashboard had to review the jobs that are run and to claim some tokens so to actually prove the um, functionality of NTX token. Um, as you're probably aware, NUNET is, is open source. It's an open source project. Um, and, and as such, community is a really important part of the product of the project. Um, so you know, thank you all for being a part of UNET and being interested in it and involved in it um, and as a community you know we really hope to grow the community and to encourage the community to work together to build the product that we all want to use um, and over time that's, that's where we're going to get to. So being an open source project that you know when this is done right it makes us much more powerful than, than even a, a, a big company can be. You know, if you look at the of Linux versus Windows, um, you know, what a community of people working together have achieved is to create the most widely used operating system in the world. Um, and so when it's open source, it really, and the community are working together, it's really, really powerful. And, and I think over time we will we will work together. Hopefully, we'll work together and become powerful as we step through everything. So you know, another reason for being open source is it's easy to build up on. And people people when when people can see what's happening underneath, people feel more confident about building on top of something. You know, and also. Because what we are is a platform and we want to integrate with other projects and other platforms, then if we're open source, then other platforms can feel confident um, integrating with us if they can see the code and they can develop things accordingly. Um, so then kind of if we let's bring it bring it on to the community testers. And you know the, the testing is a really important part of this process. Um, and you know not everyone is a developer, and that, that that is good. It's a good thing because different people look at things in different ways. And so sometimes some people are really so deep into one area or into the technicalities of one part they don't see something that's obvious to someone else, or they don't. They don't. Um, they, they they just don't don't see something. So having lots of eyes on the project, 
you know, it's going to help us make sure that we build this platform that we all want to use. So as a community, there's lots of things that you, you can, well, we can all do um, to help this move forward and, and to get to where we want to get. Now, the first thing is, is kind of testing the documentation. So as you are probably aware, We've launched the book. There's people are messaging saying, do they hear anything? Um, can, do, can people hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry, I need to remove some notifications. Okay, so documentation. So um, any of you that have been involved in this process so far are probably aware of the fact that we've got our new net public alpha documentation. Um, so this is the first thing we're testing. We're testing do all of our processes, uh, are all of our processes correctly documented? And what we've done is we've implemented this in Gitbook, so it makes it very easy for us to edit and, and control change requests to this documentation. So it's very much a living document that we want everyone to feel belongs to them to a degree. And if there's anything that you feel isn't in this document that should be in it, or something's not quite right, then Please, we want you to come forward and, and make a suggestion on how we can make it better. Um, so that's the documentation, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, then, you know, the second thing we can do is, is test functionality, and that is actually roll our sleeves up, install the software, and start using it, and 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 make sure that it's working properly, and. And if it, if it doesn't work properly, handle the way that we handle the way that we deal with that. And hopefully today I'm going to walk you through some pro processes where we we um, do some testing. Um, hopefully find the bug and and um, submit that bug um, into our GitLab issue tracker, and then we can kind of see how that process plays out, but the best way that you can do that, um, some tools that can help you with, with doing that in terms of um, troubleshooting. Um, and then other things, you know, there might be, it might not be testing functionality, but also things like suggesting improvements to the UI or to the UX, um, where you feel that, that, that something isn't quite quite right or that there's something missing, there's something that we could add to this, then please, please let us know. Get involved, raise a raise a bug, raise a, raise an issue, um, and get involved. Um, obviously there's, there's there's the other thing that you can do is you can help and educate other members of the community. And that is something that so far has been Really, quite special um, to see people in communicating and collaborating in the Discord, and new people turning up, and, and people that have been there a while jumping in and helping them out, um, telling them what to do, and and generally just just bringing everyone's level up and and helping them figure out what to do. And so now, what we'd like to try and do is to take that and try and add a bit more structure to that so that it's not just um, the knowledge isn't just kept within the Discord and within certain members within the Discord, but it's actually we put that knowledge down into the documentation. We refer people to the documentation and we bring the documentation, we, 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 we manage the documentation and by doing that, we allow people to find the information they need to help themselves, um, and everyone can uh, 
focus on on certain parts and and make sure that it's all correct. Um, and then obviously the, the, the next kind of step to this is because we're open source, um, people that are technically inclined, you know, developers can take it to the next level and they can just go into the code. If you find the bug, you find you, you see in the log, you see what what um, what what line it is in the code. You can jump into the code and go and have a look at it, you know, and and make suggestions on how to improve it. Um, and, and really, really contribute to actually building products. Um, so, back to bug reports. One thing that's absolutely for sure is we go through this testing um, and we release multiple versions of the software. One thing for sure is we are going to find bugs. You know, and, and we just want you to report them so that we can understand the full range of issues that people are having. So literally, no bug is a stupid bug. Um, because by submitting a bug, you help us understand how you perceive something or you see something. And so it's always useful when we get bug reports. Um, so, and what we're going to do is we're going to create the bug report straight in GitLab, so that when we do that, it's going to drop straight into our workflow where it can be reviewed and prioritized by the team and we can take it forward. Um, and then, You know, it may seem daunting to start going through this diagnosis of, of issues, um, you know, it's happening in the Discord channel um, at the moment, but um, I think that we're now at a stage where we, should, we, where we can create these resources to help us support each other um, and, and write this stuff down so we don't have to reinvent the wheel or keep repeating ourselves as new members of join. So, to do that, I've created a new section in the um, public account for GitHub called Troubleshooting Tools. And what I've done here is I've um, I literally just created this today. Um, and I had a bunch of commands that I was using that I, I, I kept and I was copying and pasting quite regularly. And I thought, you know what, this would be really good for everyone to have um, as a reference. So we've got lots of things in here where you can just grab a command and copy it and then execute the install. So we've got, we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit, but there is a whole bunch of stuff here and I'm actually going to use them now because what I'd like to do is to run through the process of um, installing DMS and then running a test. Um, so just one, before I do that, one last thing about Discord is as this project grows and there's tokens involved, we just got to be mindful of being safe. Be wary of links that people post in Discord. Be wary of people DMing you, asking you for info. You know, no one from the internet is going to DM you first. You know, don't just grab a script that someone's posted into the forum and run it without understanding what it is. You know, what I would like to try and achieve, or what I would like us to try and do, is to always refer people back to the documentation. And we can put these tools and scripts and things that we use commonly into the documentation, refer people to the documentation. And that way, we can kind of be sure that the right thing is being used. We can protect people from being tricked into running something malicious. And if anything changes or updates, then We've always got the latest version in one place. Okay, so if you can use links to the Git book to help people find the official link, um, you know, from from the script, you know, and you can you can take these things and you can you can I think actually you can grab a link from here copy the link and that will take someone straight to something okay so so copy and paste the links i think is a good link back to get is a good way to go okay 
Right. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up a machine. Okay, so over here I've got a new machine that is a completely brand new machine, it's just, just logged in. So actually there's a couple of things, that, this is a Windows system for Linux machine, so there's, a, there's something that we have to do, we have to enable system D uh, in order for the unit to work. So I've actually created commands that we need to run in order to do this. And then once we've enabled that, we need to restart this machine. DNS installation. Let's go to the latest version of DMS. Uh, don't worry, we'll get back to the questions. Um, I just wanted to get this part done so that um, people can see that the best way that they can contribute to the project and uh, help us get this, the, 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 the bug, bug stuff sorted out. Yeah. So while we're while we're waiting for that to install, we're going to open a new terminal here. And then one of the first things that we can do is we can actually enable login. Um, so if we go into troubleshooting tools and The option here of view filter and save log files generated by components. Um, so, a really useful command is just to grab the log from DMS. So, what this command is doing with a, slant, with a minus F on it is following the log. So, we should start to see things coming in here as and when so. so units installed so the first thing we want to do then is we want to onboard so let's go on board And got a wallet on testnet. Right, wallet address. And this is a WSL machine and claiming to use this as a service provider, so we don't need much resource. And certainly with a Windows WSL machine, it only has four gig of RAM by the default, so we need to have a little SNET. So Okay, so now we're on board. Okay, we've got a message saying we're successfully on board. Um, and we do.
So we've got peer ID and we're just waiting for some other peers to come. Um, being a, so being a stage, it's not Sorry, Abby. Uh, the peer spelling was wrong. Sorry? Uh, the, uh, command, uh, the command, the command, the peer spelling was wrong. Yeah, no, 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 right again, it's right again here. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, the next thing we need to do is get the service providers. Uh, by the way, we can have a look here and see we're getting all sorts of uh, stuff in the middle of our. Um, and actually, we see we also get lots of this RPC error that comes in a lot. That's just a constant um, menace to the log file, basically. Um, and so it's a known issue that the that is, is in the process of being fixed, but at the moment we just have this error clogging up the file. So actually, we can go to the troubleshooting tools and look at how we can change our logging to the filter the log file to give us something a bit more specific. Um, so I actually put this exact command that basically will. Filter it out by by sending the log through this grep command, which will normally only returns the, the things that match something, but the minus v switch will do the opposite. So it will give us everything except for a line that contains tracy bit export. And you see we've got tracy bit export here, so we'll just go through this one there. And now the log we're going to get the log, but it's going to be clean. Um, just while we're here, it's like, like this is this is real time. Um, but if you want to look at something back in time, you can do minus n, and then the number of lines that you want to look at, and then you'll just return just that part of the log file. So you can just go back a, back in history a little bit and find when something goes wrong, you can go back and find the bit that you need to find. Okay. So, let's do that running. We'll go back here, and now we're going to install the service provider dashboard. And then install it. Okay. So, uh, GMS doesn't have anything yet. We can, now we can go back and just check our peers. Still don't have any peers. Okay. We we'll have to wait till we get some peers before we can do anything else. Um, in the meantime, we can do a couple of things actually. Um, one is we can open up the service provider dashboard. So, let's see if that's running. Um, we've got one here now, okay, coming in. Um, okay, so we should probably wait until we have a couple more. Um, now, so there's, there's something else that we can discuss here actually. Um, back in the troubleshooting tools, um, there's some other things that are interesting. One is there's, there's a net issue, and there's a question that, that someone's asked that we'll go through it a little bit later um, about NAT. Um, and and we have this issue with peer discovery when we're behind symmetric net. Um, and there's a tool here that you can use. Um, that it's a very simple tool that you just click, click, you go to the website and it will tell you whether you're behind a normal net or whether you're behind a symmetric net. 
Um, so that's, that's a very useful, useful thing, thing to do just to check your, check your setup. Okay. okay. So, got two peers. That's probably good enough to um, do a CPU job. So, if we go in here and we'll do the CPU job, we'll take the this is the CPU service. Um, and dependencies mat dot lib. Um, let's give it a completion time of 120 minutes. I'm not quite sure how it's going to be. We need to connect the wallet before we go any further. So let's. The wallet. Okay. Now, when it comes, and actually I should have done this before, and I, I was just trying to remember the thing that I'd forgotten, and this is the thing that I forgot. Um, that there are, there's also, um, within the web browser, you have developer tools within the browser. Um, and this is, this is, very useful and undoubtedly you're going to have to use this. Um, and so basically by when you're in the browser, if you do control shift I, it will open up a console that will just open that full screen, will give you some information about what's going on, what's happening in the browser as we're running. Okay. So, I'm just going to refresh it. Sam, could you open the documentation once? Yeah. Yeah, uh, on the service provider dashboard, uh, components installation, I have included a list for the different uh, error messages uh, based on Santosh's uh, feedback. Uh, just go, go right down. Yeah. Yeah, understanding issues. This okay. Session. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah scroll a bit up. Yeah, I've provided this. Right, okay. So okay, this, is, this is a list of the different errors. I don't know what Okay, great. Um, thanks, Eddie. So, yeah. so refresh. And then let's take our CPU job. Hello. Now let's just buy some tokens. Not a lot. Some people tell me I am. And then we submit it. Okay, something went wrong. I should have done an RN and we're working to fix. Bear with us. And we've got an error message in here. 503 service unavailable. And if we go. We have got an error message in the log here. Uh, got a few things. Error, unable to extract public key from peer ID. We've got another error here saying contract request oracle failed. Now, I'm not entirely sure which one of these is a critical error that, you know, there may be other errors that occur because of something else. So, the best thing to do in this scenario is to grab a big chunk of the log. And um, 
go ahead and use it. So we've, we've, got, we've got a log here and we've got an error here. Um, so what we can do is we can go ahead and create a bug. And so this is where we create the bugs. Um, and there is actually a page you generally get directed to, and in here um, there is this page here that explains how to report the bug. Um, I have to request a new feature, um, but essentially what you do Go to a new issue. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Oh, well. Two things, I think we can say that it was, we can say it's a service provider, an error with the service provider dashboard. There's probably an underlying error um, that has come from something else, quite possibly DMS. So, um, if we have a look in here, um, Maybe it's something to do with the public key. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a copy of this log. Uh, if in doubt, more is better, but if it's thousands of lines, then it's a pain. So you can use those filtering commands to um, filter it out and get to the, the things that, are, that, that are kind of seem to be the important part. Okay. Um, so within this file, you should be able to go and apply the bug template. And when we do that, it gives us some nice text telling us what it wants us to do. All of these parts that are commented will just disappear as we go. Okay, so summary is. When trying to submit a job using the service provider dashboard, we get the something when wrong pop up and a few different errors in the DMS log. Uh, um, so let's call that issue um, failed to submit job using service provider dashboard. Okay. Um, this is this is actually quite quite an important bit. Make sure that. This hasn't happened before to a search through the issues. Um, we don't really want to create duplicates. Um, they can obviously be merged together um, or, or um, linked together, but it's just a bit of uh, a waste of your time if there's already uh, a bug that's been submitted with the same, same situation. Okay. Install from or 
going to say from a new installation install TMS on board install service provider um, try to run uh, ML on CPU job. When we click the submit button, we get a something went wrong pop up error. What is expected behavior? We haven't really known yet. Um, but it should tell us that the job's been submitted. We should get confirmation that the job has been submitted successfully. Now we've got this bit of relevant logs and screenshots. Um, so go in here now when, when we do this um, it says use code blocks to format so basically what we can do is just do uh, in three practice and then there's our log and it says also screenshots, and now we've got quite a good screenshot. Um, that's probably quite useful. So let's do that. Um, do a screen capture using Windows computer tool. Grab that. And then you can just paste it onto the clipboard and then this works quite nicely. We can just paste it in like that and it will put it in line in the text. Okay, um, now version numbers are pretty important. Um, if we go back here and look at our troubleshooting tools, top of the list, version numbers. Um, so let's just go over the version numbers to be sure. And grab the service provider dashboard. Okay, now 
I'm afraid I can't link to that and the code that might be responsible for that at the moment. Um, but you will see in the log file um, that Sometimes you'll see the component and then what line um, something's happening at. So, you know, this kind of tells you where the problem might be. Um, okay, so there we go, there's our version numbers. Um, there's our log file and a screenshot and a description of what needs to be done or what, what, what the issue is. Um, so now we can just hit create issue. And there we have our issue with our log file formatted um, and everything else. So um, what happens next? So so once we're once the issue's been logged in here, um, you can see now there's there's all sorts of things, tasks and activities that can happen. And so what will happen is um, if I can jump to it quickly. Um, I'll just give you a quick look at what happens to all these issues and how they're all dealt with. So, so this is the this is the, 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 the main issue board that the team, the development team work off of. And we have um, a backlog of issues, some open issues, and then we have what things that are on hold, um, things that are currently being worked on and doing, and things in review that are waiting to be checked, um, and then uh, maybe committed, and then a list of all the things that have been closed. So this is what happens to the, the, the bugs that you raise, is they come in here, and they're dealt with by the team in this in this board. And so when you raise the ticket, when you raise the uh, bug, then what you'll find is that you're going to start. You'll get notifications when things happen. So you're going to and you'll get the status of what's going on. And actually, if you want to look at it in relation to other things, then you can come and look on this board and see what's actually happening. And you uh, give you a pretty good insight into what's happening day to day. Um, so that is submitting a bug. Um, so I think now we can probably get back to um, there's probably one last thing that um, you might want to know about that, that currently, previously, some of you might have uh, noticed that we had a, um, a dashboard that gave us the status of the network, uh, how many devices have been onboarded, um, and that kind of thing. And um, we, we're actually in the process of changing that to a new piece of open source, again, open source software. We're not quite ready to share a dashboard with you, but what I'd like to show, show with you here is the fact that we are now collecting um, lots of different traces from within the applications, okay? So within here, we're looking in the DMS, and in the DMS, there are all sorts of um, commands or operations that, that, that are being run. And they're all being logged in here so that we can get an understanding of what's run, how long it takes to run, and we can get, get a real feel for the performance of the system. Um, and as you can see here from um, when we started the public alpha, is that as people have onboarded, it's the number of these um, the number of these events is starting to ramp up. Is that, you know, we're, we're just, just really starting, but we, we would expect this to go parabolic, hopefully parabolic. <laughs> um, and so in the, in the coming weeks, 
uh, we should get to the point where we have a dashboard that's collating some of the key metrics that we're collecting here and have them available to the community so you can see exactly like the key metrics of how many people are onboarding, how many jobs have been run, and, and some of the other stuff that we used to see, like total, total amount of RAM, total amount of CPU power, GPU power, uh, and that kind of stuff. And there should be some pretty interesting statistics as we move forward. Um, right, so I think now we can probably move to questions. Um, and we've got had two questions. I don't think I'm just checking to see if we've had any more come in since we started. Um, and the answer is, I think no. Um, oh yeah, we have got a couple more. We've got okay. So. So ones that have come in during this, um, we've had what's the difference between bootstrap peers and DHT peers? So the bootstrap peers are an initial peers um, that are on the network um, that, that you kind of connect to and you find other peers on the network. Then the then peers kind of handshake with each other, and when they do that, they kind of they add each other to their DHT or their distributed hash table. Um, and when they do, basically, the DHT peers are the machines that you are connected to and you will try and talk to to run, run jobs. And look here. You know, we're slowly building up a list of peers here. Um, it, take, it, it takes time for that to happen. Um, and, and I think with some other troubleshooting that's going on, we'll, we'll probably find out ways that we can make this a bit quicker. Hopefully that answers the question of the difference between Bootstrap and DST. Um, another question says, I've installed my node and it seems to be running. How can I see what it's doing, if it's doing anything? And it is the dashboard operation there. Well, I think hopefully I've just answered that question in what I've just shown you. Um, in that, when you install the node um, and it seems to be running like this, it seems to be running because we can give it a command and it, and it responds to us. But the way that you can see what it's doing is that you can look at the log. You know, and you use this to do certain. Journal CTL, and, and there's, there's various commands that I've put in there that enable you to filter it in different ways so you can see stuff. There's also, you may also be asked to enable debugging. Um, and um, I think I'm going to run out of time because I can't really show you how to do that now. Um, but maybe we can address that in another topic. But you should also be able to go and find it in. In here, uh, I think I put in something here. Enable debugging mode. So here you go. From time to time, you're able to see more information in standard logging. You, someone might ask you to do this. Someone might say, if you talk to someone in Discord or you raise an issue and you submit a log, someone might say, okay, can you can you enable debug mode? Run that again. So basically, you just have to edit this file. You can just copy this and with this command, edit it, add this line, it's debug equal true into that line, and then restart the service. And when you when you re, when you actually reload uh, system D, and then you restart the service, and then that change will take effect, and you'll see loads of stuff in the log file. Um, so that's really how you can see everything that's going on. Um, and then we've got two more questions. Um, one that I'm going to answer, and one that I'm going to hand over to Kabir. Um, so, uh, in fact, I've got two more to answer. One is how many nodes per IP address can we run? Um, 
and there's not really a finite number to that. Um, it really comes down to your router and your internet connection and, and what it can handle. Um, there's no reason why you can't have multiple nodes on your network behind a single IP address. The, 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 the NAT should work that out. Um, as long as you don't have a symmetric NAT, which brings me on to the next question, which is, can you explain the NAT issues? And this is the one that I'm slightly dreading trying to explain. <laughs> um, and so, what's the deal with symmetric NAT issues? I'm going to try and explain this simply. Um, so, when the peers in UNIT share their details with, you, with each other, they do this via the, 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 the DHT. So, when you see those DHT peers, um, and what they do is they 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 share that, they share the information with each other. And when they do that, they keep a record of a peer and its IP address and the port number that is used to access it. Now, so so the basically that's an address. It's an IP address plus a port number that that your node can use to hit the other node. But when we're using symmetric NAT. When, 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 not when we're using, when, when you have a symmetric NAT in place, then what happens is every external IP address um, that, that is from outside is mapped to a different port. So um, what that means is, is if, if I communicate with one machine and go out through the NAT, it's going to have my IP address and, and a port number on it. And with a non-symmetric NAT, that port number will kind of still be open. So when you, you can kind of come, some, another computer can come back through that port number and, and connect to your node and, and make the connection. But when you have a symmetric NAT, that, that doesn't happen, that every external IP address to your router has to have a different port number. And so you, your device looks it up in the hash table and then tries to connect to it, but the, the, the NAT won't allow that to happen. Um, so, sorry if that's a bad explanation, it's a pretty difficult thing to explain. Um, there are lots of resources on the, the internet to look it up, but it, it still doesn't make it any easier, it seems. Um, what I will say is that I know it's, I, 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 put a note and say, I know this seems really complicated, and why do we have so many problems with this? And I think that maybe it's not just the fact that someone's got some cranky router that's got symmetric NAT installed on it, um, but it's possibly to do with ISPs who are using internal uh, private IP addresses between the, uh, between your router and the internet. And the classic example of this is mobile phone um, connected to 5G, um, connects onto the mobile operator's network. You'll have a, a, an IP address that's an internal network operator's IP address, and then it's going to go out through another router before it gets an internet address. Um, and that, that can be the same with residential um, connections as well. And when you have two NATs in place, that just causes all sorts of havoc with two-way communication, the peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, so it's quite possibly just an ISP issue. Um, and in terms of what's going on with it, we've got the checking tool to be able to check. Um, we have got a relaying situation, so if you are behind a symmetric NAT, then relay nodes should figure that out and help you, like you make a relay connection to you, and then, or you will make a relay connection to them, and they will help you discover other peers through by relaying traffic. Um, and so I think that brings me to the end of all the questions and what I wanted to run through with you regarding the uh, logging a bug. Um, Kabir, 
Did you want to have a talk about the last question? Yes, I guess it's a little bit too much to call it a talk. We have five minutes, right? <laughs> we are. Oh, sorry, I did. I, I, I kind of yeah, yeah. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Uh, so I think, I think the question is what role or roles in that will. So, first of all, hi all. Yeah. And what role or roles in that will play within the similar network ecosystem? Right? This one. Yes, that's correct. All right, so I will read it uh, for one. And uh, so, uh, what, what role of the will play within the similar network system? Is it training of all kinds of AI models from projects under the similar network umbrella, or also training from AI models so that it's from not similar network related projects or industries? So, as always, there are like uh, long answers and short answers, so I'll try to make it short. Uh, but uh, so the short answer is no, not just from similar net umbrella, but basically NUNET is a generic, I mean, we can uh, go back a little bit to history. We started as a, as a hardware infrastructure there for similar net, however, we are building it to be generic, meaning we can uh, basically uh, aiming to, to, to be able to run not, not only, only AI models, not only AI training models, because this, this, this is just, uh, well, just a use case for the public alpha, but the basic generic computation workflows from pretty much everywhere. However, since we are not, is, is first of all, we are a system number, second of all, we respond from singular net. Uh, which means that we are kind of aiming to first of all run singular net AI models, or models which are from the singular net marketplace. And that is not just because we want to, to do that first, but also because similar that allows AI models to be monetized on the marketplace. So that we can, let's say, connect our autonomic system so that models uh, which are monetized can uh, relate to one, let's say, part of this um, monetization can go to uh, hardware providers, computer providers, but part of that can go also within the same autonomous system can go to embrace uh, algorithm uh, developers, so basically the yeah, yeah, algorithm developers who... So, so yeah. yeah, so that, that is why it's related to similar matter first. However, as a technology, we are in no way constrained by that. We are aiming to uh, be able to deploy any computing workflow and also not only training AI, but, but basically understand. However, that anything means that we should be able to allow for different um, compute, uh, compute workflows to use different uh, hardware. And AI, or basic model training, machine learning, uh, the training part is uh, specific in the sense that it needs a lot of GPU power. And this is something that we decided to do first as a use case for the, for the public alpha. So that would be. Pretty much all awesome. I hope that, that makes sense. And thanks for the question. Nice. Okay, thanks, thanks to Um And we got there one minute before we were due to finish. That's not bad going. Um, right, if um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so uh, I think we're going to call it a wrap. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, and having a look at this, um, I will see all of you in Discord. If you've got any questions, you can hit me up on Discord. Um, and if you've got any suggestions for other things that you want to see, other videos that you want to see, you want me to do, um, or any technical discussions, that, that topics for technical discussions, please put them through to me and um, we'll see what we can do. Thank, Thank you all very much for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for the time. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks all. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.